think at the end of the day, the role of the central bank is to facilitate government borrowing. That is, But the simple reality is, is that there are market failures. And the solution to a creditor who can't pay his promises is bankruptcy. It's, it's default. So how do you distinguish between a economic system and a state system then? How is Stalin not simply a r ridiculously successful entrepreneur? But to compare J.D. Rockefeller to Stalin is really horrific. Stalin and Hitler are levels of their own, in the sense of their, their brutality. There's nothing entrepreneurial about what they do. There's nothing... When we have this type of system, we do have to have breaks. We do have to have mechanisms. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. Perhaps no other entities in the world have as much impact on our daily global society than central banks. They determine the cost and availability of our currency and credit. Commerce, trade, investing for tomorrow, and spending for today, the global flow of money is tremendously influenced by modern central bank policy, as are the prices we pay for all goods and services. Which is why, at a time when inflation is running at 40-year highs and putting a painful pinch on household and corporate budgets alike around the world, when most nations are seeing GDP growth slow or even contract, and when record high asset valuations are now correcting into the double digits, it's worth asking the questions, are the central banks doing a good job? Is this the right model for managing the global economy, or is there a better way to do this? In short, do we really need central banks? In the first of what I hope will be an ongoing series of debates on Wealthion, we've invited two oppositionally minded experts to tackle this topic. Arguing for the central banking model will be Mike Green, chief strategist and portfolio manager at Simplify Asset Management. And arguing the opposing side will be Yaron Brook, host of The Yaron Brook Show and chairman of the board at the Ayn Rand Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much for agreeing to appear here and having what I'm sure will be an insight-rich, animated, yet respectful debate about a topic of great interest to our audience. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, gentlemen. Well, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I know we've got a lot of interest in this discussion, so let's just roll up our sleeves uh, and dive right in here. And if it's okay, Mike, let's start with you. And if we can just start with you, just sort of setting the quick context for why central banks exist today. Um, we obviously have them for a reason. Um, so you know, what, what is the core role of central banking supposed to be? So the core role of central banking takes place in any society in which you decide that you are going to have a limit of private claims against other individuals or other entities. The minute you decide that you are going to place any limit, in other words, you cannot put somebody into debt slavery, you cannot take possession of somebody's body, you need to have an adjudicant who is capable of resolving those disputes. That's what a central bank is. It is the intermediary who plays the role as the lender of last resort to facilitate the solution of claims. All right. I think that term is probably going to come up a fair amount in this discussion. Can you just define lender of last resort? Sure. The lender of last resort is somebody who ultimately says, I will take this collateral that is currently illiquid, but I believe to be of adequate value. And I will give you something that there is no question as to the provenance or its ability to settle a claim, for example, cash. Okay, great. And, and the reason why the low role of lender of last resort is important, and I'm going to put some words in your mouth, feel free to correct them in any way, is at times in, in history, um, we have had um, instances maybe sort of cascading uh, defaults in the system, um, which if left unchecked could just plunge us into a, a bad place we don't want to be. And trust has been lost in the system where market participants aren't interacting with each other, um, aren't necessarily lending to each other and credit's a huge lubricant of, of commerce. Um, so the Fed steps in and can play a role and say, hey, I'll be the trusted party that will exchange with you guys. And it sort of hopefully stops that cascade effect from getting worse. Did I describe that accurately? I, I think that's reasonable. And I, you know, we will introduce these terms in the future, but remember what credit is. Credit is ultimately private money, right? It is me saying, I am going to actually make good on some future uh, obligation. 
right? Or somebody else that I have lent money to, I stand behind their claim. A central bank interjecting itself as the lender of last resort is willing to exchange that claim that I have against another private individual with a claim against the state. That's it. That's all they're doing. All right. And so, you, Yaron, I'll come to yeah. you with some specific yeah. uh, questions in, in a bit. But as you have any reaction to what Mike is saying here, because I have a few other sort of introductory questions here, just feel free to chime in. As Yeah, as absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I don't get that at all. So uh, I don't get the need for a, a, a lend of last resort. Um, I don't get, uh, I don't think that was what motivated the creation of the Federal Reserve or, or any central bank for that matter. Um, and uh, so the solution to a creditor who can't pay, who can't uh, live up to uh, uh, his promises is bankruptcy. It's, it's default. Uh, default is priced in credit. It's not unusual. There, there is, uh, it, 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 is uh, uh, it is something that financial institutions know how to deal with. Um, and, and deal with quite well without a Federal Reserve. Indeed, the spiraling effect that you described, Adam, um, it just has never, it, it really hasn't happened. Um, so uh, even the 1907 crisis, which was in the United States, which was uh, as close as we've got to spiraling out of control of claims uh, piling up and, and no way to resolve it, was ultimately resolved privately by uh, not a government entity, but by private institutions, by JP Morgan and some other bankers getting into a room and settling the claims and allowing some to go bankrupt and some uh, to be paid out and uh, assessing uh, each claim based on what private bankers assess it on, based on a profit motive, based on whether uh, these claims were good claims or bad claims and so on. And there was no land of last resort in that circumstance. Um, indeed, the extent to which the government intervened in that crisis only made it worse, not better. And, and the reality is that when you have a lend of last resort, what they inject into a system is not the resolution of claims and not the resolution of credit problem issues, but what they inject is malinvestment. What they inject in is a distortion to the allocation of capital. They bail out, they, they become... Uh, the uh, arbiters of who wins and who loses. And uh, because central banks are political entities, because they are government entities, um, those kind of decisions get determined by politics. I, I'll just use one quick example that maybe some of your uh, listeners remember. Why was Goldman Sachs, uh, sorry, why was Lehman Brothers allowed to fail and, uh, and um, the insurance company uh, AIG. AIG bailed out within 24 hours. Uh, Sunday night, Lehman Brothers was told, you're done. You, you're bankrupt tomorrow morning. And uh, that evening, the Monday evening, uh, AIG was, was bailed out. Uh, is that not politics? Is that, I mean, what was the reasoning? Is it, is it an accident that uh, uh, the Treasury Secretary is a, is a Goldman alum? I mean, there's just no way to, no way to unwind this without realizing so what the Federal Reserve or any central bank does is, uh, is to a large extent political. So I would like all that resolution of private credit and, and uh, uh, to be done privately. Uh, there are institutions, private institutions that can handle it. Uh, the profit motive should be the guide to how to handle it. And of course, our legal system has developed very robust rules around bankruptcy to deal exactly with these situations. And you don't have to send people to jail in order to in order to solve these problems, and I'll just say again, before World War One, before 1914, there was no central bank in the United States. Uh, we did okay. Uh, the system wasn't great, but we did okay. And before 1935, there was no central bank in Canada, and the Canadian banking system did great. Uh, no financial crises in Canada throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, um, and uh, with no central bank. And you can also look at places like Scotland and other places where there was no central bank and they did phenomenally well. So um, we can talk about what I view the central bank is really about, but I don't think it's really about a uh, 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 lend of last resort. So I think that creates a challenge, right? Because if, if, we, if we disagree that the core role or at least intent behind a central bank is to be that lender of good, yeah. lender of last resort against good collateral, right? Then you know, I, either we're going to move into a conspiracy dynamic of the central bank is designed to accomplish some nefarious objective, or we could argue that it effectively has replaced 
the private network of financing, you know, the state itself, right? The the borrowing capacity of the state. But I'm not quite sure that we're we're in a place that we can have a debate if if we don't have an agreement as to what that role is. So I, 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 I'm interested as what you think that role is. So I think at the end of the day, the role of the central bank is to facilitate government borrowing. That is the role of the central bank is to allow the government to control the money supply. I, I, I think I, without, I don't believe in conspiracies. There's no conspiracy theory here. I think that after 1907, um, the, the, the government basically uh, came to the conclusion that we didn't want to trust private entrepreneurs to uh, resolve uh, issues, uh, you know, uh, within the economic issues. We didn't want to leave it up to private enterprise to deal with these things. Uh, we want to bring it under government control. Part of it was motivated, I think, by better people, I think mistaken, but better people who thought this was this was a way to create a more stable uh, economic system, a more stable banking system. But I think part of it was motivated by power. Part of it was motivated by how dare somebody like J.P. Morgan have so much power over economic activity. This really should be part of state action. This should be part of the state. And it turns out that once you give the central bank the power to uh, print money and to buy bonds and to engage in that, well, it turns out that it's not a bad ATM for uh, government spending, that is, uh, you know, for, for a, a growing welfare state. Uh, FDR discovered this in the 1930s. Uh, you know, uh, um, it was in the 1960s, it was a, a great ATM to fund the welfare state, the new welfare state that was being created by the Great Society. Um, and, uh, and ever since, you know, since uh, 1971, when we go, went over the, the tiny remnants of a gold standard, uh, it's basically being an ATM for the government to, to, to print money. And yes, it bails out banks, but it bails out the system usually from problems that it created. So most systemic risk in the system that exists today, I'd say over 90% of the systemic risk that exists in the system today is created by the fact that we have a Federal Reserve. Uh, it, it is the most systemic entity in, in the economy. It Every action it commits to has implications to the entire system. It sets interest rates wrong, and we debate what wrong is, but it, if it sets interest rates wrong, it affects everything. It, it interest rates are, are, are something that, that is not, that, that doesn't just affect a sector, just a location. So, so I, think, I, I think while some people intended the central bank to be this land of last resort, to increase stability and to do all that, uh, it has not done any of that. It has not executed on that role, and it's actually, uh, evolved much more into what the Bank of England was. I mean, the Bank of England was the ATM for the king. I mean, it was it was to fund his wars. I mean, why why borrow money from the Jewish moneylenders and have to pay exorbitant interest and then you know have to have to do a pogrom once in a while to get rid of your uh, of the people who lent you money? Instead, you can you can establish a, a a central bank that that goes into debt for you in a sense. And funds uh, your wars. So I think it's a it's a mechanism to fund government, and in that sense, I think it's a it's a corrupt and and uh, an immoral system by which the government gets around a, a lot of the constraints the private sector places on its activities. So I think that actually then we do actually somewhat have a unifying definition, right? Because what you're describing is a situation in which you want to limit the claims that a private individual has or the power that a private individual has in the role of society, whether that's a quote unquote Jewish banker or whether that is JP Morgan, ultimately it is society saying we are going to place limits on that individual. We would prefer to have this be a socialized function. Now, whether that grows into a corrupt institution or not, I'm not going to defend that aspect of it. I agree with you that the central bank has become far more activist and far more corrupt in its enabling of state activity than ultimately it should have. Mm -hmm. But that importance for me of the limitation of the role of a single private individual or a subset of private individuals, whether that's a collectivist elitist class of Protestants in New York City, or whether that's Jewish bankers in, in the case of you know, the Catholic church era, I, I, I could care less. I think that it is important to play, recognize that as a society, we decide to place limits on, other, on individuals' rights 
of claims against other individuals? So, so yes, I, I think that's right. I agree with the, that we've decided that. I think it's a wrong decision. I, I, I don't think we should place limits on, on these claims. Again, I think bankruptcy is the way that these- But bankruptcy claims... is a limit on that claim, right? Okay, I mean... so, bank, so bankruptcy is the form in which I would like to see that limit placed. I don't think it's right for us to socialize banking. I don't think it's right for us to socialize money. I think that is, I, I mean, you seem to think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you know, a central bank can be this lend of last resort and stay pure. I don't think it can. I think it's, I think inherent in central planning, inherent in being the lend of last resort with a monopoly power given to it by the government, inherent in that is the corruption of the system. It cannot stay pure. It has to be corrupt. I think what you lose is what you lose is market discipline. The beauty of a system that relies on the JP Morgans and different bankers in different places is that if they screw up, they go bankrupt, they lose, somebody else rises up to, to do a better job. There's no, uh, markets are beautiful self-correcting mechanisms and they rely on something that I think is also beautiful, which is the profit motive, the, the self-interested profit motive, which I think uh, keeps them away from that corruption. And I think when we socialize that, when we socialize any function like that, whether we socialize it in any industry, we corrupt it and we destroy that self-correcting mechanism and that dynamic of what self-interest does in, in keeping the system uh, functioning effect, effect, effectively and efficiently. So again, <clears throat> I, I think the challenge is, is that we have to go back further in history, right? Because with the 14th Amendment, we, introdu we introduced the idea of corporate personhood which functionally removed the limitations that have historically existed on any one individual accumulating power by giving them unlimited life. Again, once you do something like that, then you have to make a social decision that you're going to place limitations on that power. The role of personal and corporate bankruptcy was introduced in the late 19th century with the introduction of limited liability corporations, precisely to encourage risk-taking and create a condition under which there was a limitation on the claim that could be made for a failed business venture, a failed personal venture, et cetera. But once you do that, once you introduce the idea of personal bankruptcy, you are socializing losses. You are restricting the claim of an individual against it. Could you, increase, could you allow that to increase the cost of credit? Absolutely. And in many situations, that's the case. But when you have individuals like a JP Morgan who becomes so powerful that ultimately they're able to determine the rise and fall of a social system. That's where the role of a central bank comes in. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think they ever got that powerful. Uh, I, I don't believe that JP Morgan was ever that, that powerful enough to do that. Uh, I, again, I think markets are self-correcting mechanisms that don't allow people to gain that kind of power. Uh, I think in particular, if you actually uh, keep the government out of the economy, uh, then, uh, you know, so you, you, you don't mingle economics with politics. Uh, economic power is not a threat to anybody. Uh, so, uh, you know, let, you know, let JP Morgan become as powerful as he can be within a market system. But if it's truly a market system, there will be competitors to him. And his, his uh, power will be limited by competition, by the marketplace. So introducing a, a monopolized system, which is what the central bank is, um, shifts power away from JP Morgan. That's right. But it gives now unlimited power almost to a system that is bound to be politicized and where when it makes a mistake, see if JP Morgan makes a mistake, that mistake is local. It might have repercussions beyond local because he is so big, but it's not gonna be national. It's not gonna be devastating. When a Fed makes the mistake, you get a Great Depression, you get you you get stagflation, you get you get massive consequences, and and that kind of power, um, we can call it socialized, but what, however we want to call it, that kind of power should not be granted to any human being, particularly not through state power, because what state power gives them is force, is the ability to enforce that in a way. Um, that you can't enforce that J.P. Morgan could never enforce his rules, right? Right? If the Federal Reserve passes regulation on the banking system or decides uh, you can't compete with it because you know it, it is the monopoly over the issuance of money, um, then you go to jail if you try. 
Nobody went to the jail to competing for JP Morgan. So how do you distinguish between a economic system and a state system then? How is Stalin not simply a r ridiculously successful entrepreneur? Oh, because I, I distinguish the fundamental distinguishing characteristic is force, it's coercion. Um, state, a state system is a system based on coercion. An economic system is based on voluntary exchange. Stalin is not an entrepreneur because he didn't use voluntary exchange. He didn't use the power of the market. He used coercion. He used force, um, and and that's what the what, that's what the central bank does. It is it is a institution of force. It is an institution of coercion. Um, I believe that the institution of coercion should be very limited to where coercion is appropriate, and coercion is appropriate in only one function, and that is in self defense. So uh, government should be limited exclusively to self-defense, which means um, a military, a police force, and a judiciary that helps arbitrate disputes so that we don't get gunfights in the streets. Uh, but other than that, government should not have any role in the economy because government essentially is coercion. Coercion has no place in healthcare, coercion has no place in education, and coercion has no place in money. All of those should be left to, 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 to voluntary exchange to markets. But are you, are, so are you actually naive? I mean, I'm sorry to say it this That's way, fine. but, but are, you, are you truly naive enough to believe that J.P. Morgan did not engage in coercion? I am uh, I'm truly naive to believe that most of what J.P. Morgan did was not coercive. Yes, he did. Let me finish. He did apply. He did use government on occasion. Um, but that's what we should be limiting. That's what we should be restricting the ability of a businessman to, uh, the, the, to, to get to engage with the government to use the force of government. So uh, it's only government that can use coercion. So, to the, so cronyism should be banned. And the way you ban cronyism is you don't give government power over the economy. And, and, and again, what is a central bank under those dynamics, except recognizing in 1907 that J.P. Morgan had accumulated enough personal power that he was able to significantly deploy coercion and a decision by the state to restrict that? But he didn't deploy coercion in 1907. In 1907, was not a he, of course, he didn't. He didn't go to deploy coercion. He didn't use the government to settle those disputes. He settled those privately, voluntarily. There was no coercion implied. There was no gun. There was no prison. There was no force uh, initiated. I, he chose uh, to engage in transaction with some people and chose not to engage in transaction with other people. That's what we do in the marketplace every single day. I, I go and engage in, 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 in a transaction with one store and I don't engage in a transaction with another store. I'm not using coercion against the store I didn't go into and didn't trade with. So not trading with somebody is not coercion. So JP Morgan did not use coercion. And certainly, uh, uh, you know, the system we had in 1907 is not ideal. I'm not defending that system. It could have been a lot better because it could have been a lot freer. It could have uh, had the government be even more removed from the market than it was. You don't solve problems of slight coercion by creating an entity that can use coercion on large scale. That is, if coercion is corrupting, then you don't, inc you don't solve that problem by creating even bigger institutions that can use coercion, which is what Central Bank is. It's a, it's a coercive entity on a large scale with a monopoly over the most important feature of an economy, which is money. So one, neither of us was in the smoke-filled room in which the decisions of 1907 were made, but I'm fairly certain that the threat, significant threats were deployed in terms of allowing or encouraging this, the resolution of claims between private individuals. There's a big difference between me telling you, if you don't do X, I'm not going to I'm not going to continue to engage with you. And between me telling you, if you don't do X, I'm going to break your legs. Uh, I think there's a fundamental philosophical difference between those two statements. And I don't think JP Morgan used the break the legs example. Um, I think he used, I won't do business with you in the future. And that, that is free markets. That's how markets work. Sometimes you don't do business with people. That's not coercion. Government always uses the break the leg analogy. That is everything you do with regard to government is if you don't do what they tell you, they do the equivalent of baking your legs. They take you to jail, they, they fine you, they, but that's the equivalent of using force against you. So there's a, there's a fundamental difference between what happened in that smoke-filled room and what happened in the room 
that Bernanke and Paulson brought in 10 bankers and forced them to sign a document that they accept top, where they were told that their business would be shut down by government, not shut down because bank A wouldn't do business with bank B, but because the government would send its regulators over and, and, and deal with that bank. That is coercion, and that's something J.P. Morgan could not do. And yes, there was always an alternative to J.P. Morgan. There's always somebody else. There's always competition in a market. In every market, there's competition. So uh, the idea that if J.P. Morgan had screwed up in 1907, some other banker would have arisen and competed him out of business. Gentlemen, if you don't mind, let, let, let me ask a contemporary, uh, more contemporary example question here, which is, um, uh, Yaron, we'll start with you. Um, seems the debate here is, is all about sort of um, protecting against players getting unfair advantage, accumulating unfair advantage. Um, so in, in your more market-driven world, um, how would you prevent against uh, the big players operating in a cartel-like fashion? Um, certainly, I think you could, you could say today in many different industries, but, but certainly banking, you know, it's dominated by a few very big banks. Um, clearly, they have written regulations and influenced politicians to advance their advantage. And I'm sure you would say that's an example of government being too involved. But, but in, in your much more freer world, how would you prevent the winners from concentrating power like that? I wouldn't. I mean, I have no problem with concentrated power because in a free world, in a free market, when it is abused, it is competed out of existence. And they have fantastic examples from uh, places that were freer in the past where, where, where this actually happened. I mean, it even happened with maybe the classic example of monopoly power, which is uh, Rockefeller oil. I mean, Rockefeller had 92% of all the oil refining capacity in the United States in the 1870s. You would, by definition today, call that a monopoly and urge the government to go break him up. But the fact is, by the time he was broken up in the 1920s uh, by the government, by the courts, he only had 20-something percent, 22 or 23% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. How did that happen? Uh, two things. One is because as you grow big, uh, the, in a, the, in, in, the, the diseconomies of scale and, and competitors rose up and beat him in certain aspects to it. Second, electricity. I mean, one of the things, one of the amazing things, and this is where regulators and, and, and all, none of us can predict what the substitute product will be. Electricity competed uh, Rockefeller out of the business of lighting, which you know, he took a big hit over that, and that created opportunities for others to arise. Gasoline for automobiles created opportunities for others to arise. So competition will always come about if you start abusing the power that you have. Rockefeller didn't abuse the power that he had, and he still got competition. Prices every year uh, went down and quality went up. So I have no problem. I have no problem with cartels. I, they won't survive for very long. Uh, in a free market, I have no problem with so-called monopolies. They won't survive for very long in a true free market. Uh, when the government chooses winners and losers, that's what scares me. When the government gives you monopoly power like it did for at and for many years, um, that is what I think is harmful and dangerous. It's not when private entrepreneurs do well. It, it, you know, uh, examples of big so-called monopolies, uh, you know, IBM, remember those guys? Um, uh, Alcoa uh, aluminum, what damage exactly did they do economically to anybody because they had market power? None, and there was actually much more competition than any regulator, or any central planner could ever imagine. All right, so, so Mike, I'm just curious. Quick, I'm sorry, I just wanna, I wanna make yeah. sure that we're on the same yep. page here. So you're saying your evidence for that is, is that Standard Oil went from a 92% market share of a startup industry to roughly 70% in the 1920s before- 20, it was 23%. 23%. When it was broken up. By the time 23. it was broken up. So yeah. are you actually aware that Standard Oil was broken up in 1911? So sorry, so 1911, it was 23%. Oh, no, but let's be clear, it had 64% market share when it was broken up. No, it had oh, a lot less than that. That is absolutely correct. Of an industry that- had I'll, look, I'll look it up afterwards and I encourage everybody to look it up. I encourage everybody I mean, that's to look 64%. that up. 64%. Prices have gone can, down every single- We have our own opinions, but we cannot have our own facts. I agree Steel with that. It was broken up in 1911. It had 64% market share of the US energy market, which had grown dramatically from a market that was largely supplied by individuals cutting down trees in their backyards to a centralized system. 
That is a perfect think, example of the but, 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 but it's but it but that is but that is wonderful. I mean, I mean, J.D. Rockefeller is one of the great heroes of of of, uh, of America, and it, it, he he facilitated. Uh, the lowering of the cost for lighting for Americans. He facilitated the auto industry. The fact, you know, let's accept your let's accept your data. It looks like you looked it up, so may, maybe maybe I'm wrong here. Um, it doesn't matter to me. That is, the, there was no damage done by the fact that Standard Oil had sixty something percent of of this massive industry. Um, it, indeed, quite the contrary. The fact that it had those economies of scale allowed it to lower prices so that we had an automobile revolution. We had a gasoline revolution. We had a plastics revolution. So um, J.D. Rockefeller is a hero of American, uh, of American progress, um, and we should be celebrating his so-called monopoly. Uh, so, no, I have no problem with cartels, so-called monopolies, as long as they are in a free market and as long as they're not allowed to in a way, you know, wind themselves up with government and use government coercion in order to attain their monopolies to the extent that any of these people did that, you know, that's what should be stopped. All right. And that, that, that's the spirit of my question. And I'm directing it now to you, Mike, which is from your comments, I assume you think we should have an agent somewhere in the system that tries to prevent that uh, unfair collaboration, coordination between private industry and the government uh, to be able to create a sustaining cartel. And I guess my question for you is, 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 does that need to be done by a central bank for the banking system? Or to Yaron's earlier points, could we just have laws that get activated in certain cases and let the legal system take over? So the, the challenge with this simple solution of let's just have laws, right, is the dynamics of regulatory capture, which we see on a very regular basis today, even. So you know, first of all, I would actually agree with much of what you're on set. John D. Rockefeller should be should be celebrated as a remarkable entrepreneur and innovator. His willingness and his vision to invest in the infrastructure required to build the refining capacity and the oil production capacity in the United States was an unquestioned contributor to the innovation and, and dyna dynamism that emerged in the United States in the 20th century once he was broken up and competition reemerged. Today's entrepreneur can become the monopolist who captures the system. That's the concern around it. You're on highlighted AT&T. Again, I completely agree. The innovation of Alexander Graham Bell and others like him in the, in the follow-on institution that created the communications networks had stultified and become suffocating to competition by 1980. When we broke that up, it introduced remarkable innovation. That is a role for the state. That's why we have antitrust laws. That's why we're supposed to enforce them. The fact that we don't do it today is a mistake. And, and again, completely agree with your own. It is you know, mercurial and um, I'm trying to think of the right world, but word, but I'll use political to decide that today we allow Lehman Brothers to fail because you know, um, uh, Hank, what's his name at Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson at Goldman Sachs doesn't happen to like the head of Lehman Brothers or doesn't like the competition while bailing out AIG the next day. Now, the reality is why that happened is because they were unaware of the degree to which the failure of, of Lehman Brothers would lead to the subsequent failure of AIG. There was very much a, oh my God, what have we done moment after that event. But the simple reality is, is that when we talk about enforcing these dynamics, there are market failures. And yes, completely agree. They can, be, they can be facilitated and encouraged by manipulation of the system, the capture of the regulatory framework, and the existence of an overly large um, state system is a terrible thing. But I think it'd be completely absurd to separate the two and say that there is not, that there's a meaningful difference between Stalin and JP Morgan or John D. Rockefeller. Oh, Stalin is just taken to the extreme without the feedback mechanisms that allows it to be stopped. I mean, that is that is that is really absurd, if I can say so. I mean, um, it, that's worse than getting the facts wrong. And by the way, the AT and T stuff again, you don't get to choose your facts. AT and T was granted a government monopoly over long distance telephone. It, 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 it was it was not that it just it, through market power got to the position that it did. It was granted a government monopoly. But to compare J.D. Rockefeller to Stalin is really horrific. Uh, Stalin was uh, was a brutal 
uh, and it, it, a, a brutal dictator who used force to gain everything that he achieved. He produced nothing. He created nothing. He provided no value to anybody. We're talking about entrepreneurs that actually built, created, made, made this country what it is. And it, it, they function on a completely different level at a completely different way than a Stalin or any politician that we have in Washington, D.C. today. They actually produce, whereas politicians do not. But Stalin is in a Stalin and Hitler on levels of their own, in the sense of their, their brutality, there's nothing entrepreneurial about what they do. There's nothing entrepreneurial about the mafia. There's nothing entrepreneurial about using force in order to steal people's stuff. And that's what a Stalin and a Hitler do. Uh, J.D. Rockefeller did not steal anybody's stuff. He created, he built something that had 92% of the refining capacity in the U.S. Good for him. Uh, you, 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 you know, we don't have a right to competition. We don't have a right to have a low, uh, uh, our entrepreneurs have, a, a, you know, a, a low percentage of the market that they have. Um, and indeed, again, JP Morgan, uh, all these, uh, if you look at market, so-called market monopolies, uh, uh, Alcoa, uh, Standard Oil, uh, or, uh, or I IBM, in every single one of these cases, prices went down every year and quality went up every year. They did exactly the opposite of what is bogusly taught in Economics 101, that a monopoly that monopolies behave in a particular way. They don't behave in that way they, because these are businessmen who know that in order to sustain their market share, they have to provide value. Stalin didn't have to provide value. He just had to kill enough people. And, uh, and that is a fundamental difference between Stalin and an entrepreneur. So again, I want to be very clear. I think that John D. Rockefeller was a remarkable entrepreneur. I think he contributed dramatically to the growth of the United States. I'm making the comparison between Stalin and John D. Rockefeller, not because I'm linking the two in terms of their contributions of humanity, but instead of their ability to dominate a system. But, but, but it's, it's a completely false, it's a completely false way of comparing them because one, there's a fundamental difference between dealing with people using force, using a fist and a knife and a gun, and, and interacting with people through voluntary exchange. Those are fundamental different. One is economic power, one is political power, and they're fundamentally different. And I think comparing them and blurring the differences between them is a massive, massive distortion of history. And it's, um, it, and it's, 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 a, this, uh, it's unjust to people like JP Morgan or any businessman, because this is true of any entrepreneur, uh, any entrepreneur makes money, to compare them in any dimension to a Stalin, I think is just you know, absurd. And I think, I think wrong, morally wrong, because I think one, is, one person is evil, Stalin is evil, and, and many politicians are evil because they use force in order to attain their gain. I think the mafia is evil. And I think somebody heroic, which we agree is a good guy, like Rockefeller, because they offer value. Those are two cognitively, uh, you know, uh, uh, epistemologically, those are two different ideas. One is forced, one is voluntary exchange. We should mix them up. Sorry, I get passionate about this, but th I think this no, is- a I, 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 I understand your passion and unfortunately I share it in many respects, right? But I'm drawing the distinction because I really truly don't think that there is a significant difference between somebody saying, if you don't do what I say, you will never do business again in this town, and I will eject your family from the you know, rental property that I own and control, and I will ensure that nobody in my business network ever speaks to you ever again, and saying, I'm going to break your kneecaps. I think there's a big difference. I think there's a big difference. And, uh, and, and that's assuming that that's how they did business. So that was a dominant way of doing business, which is not true. But I think there's a big difference, even if it was. Okay, well, look, I, I want I to move on, wrap around to sort of the, the original question to, to Mike, which was sort of, okay, what's the role of the central bank here? And, and I think we've done a good job talking about, you think a, a big part of it is the role it plays in trying in, in prevent, or the role it's supposed to play um, in, in preventing uh, few market participants from ending up with all the marbles, right? Um, and I guess one question I have for you on that, Mike, is what do you think is more important in terms of a central bank's function? Is it preventing that or is it preventing, you know, the the smooth functioning of the economy and being the, the rescuer of last resort in times of distress? 
Well, unfortunately, Again, my theoretically right here. Now, my role right now is to close the door to my office because my dogs are barking. So give me <laughs> one second. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm sorry. Um, the question the question was, is the primary role of the central bank to prevent the accumulation of power or is it to smooth the dynamics in a panic? Is that your question? Yes. And I, I didn't necessarily say primary, but which was more important of the two, if you think there's an even more supreme reason for their existence. But I was asking you to sort of relatively pick between the two. So, I, I, yeah, if I'm picking between the two, I would focus on the former. I'm much more interested in the, the reduction in the accumulation of individual power. But if I'm being realistic about how the role is being played today, it is in reducing the friction or um, change in ownership, right, that occurs in panics. And this is actually, so, so this I do want to be very clear that I'm 100% and what I would believe is alignment with your own. The primary difference between debt and equity in a capital structure is that a debt contract has provisions for change of control, mm -hmm. right? When a central bank steps in and abrogates those provisions, then you have a problem. And so this, this is where I think people completely agree that the central bank has continually overstepped its role in that process. That is what's so totally different about what's happening in the central bank today. And part of the reason why I think that actually it's, it's so interesting that in many ways I would argue we agree violence aside um, far more than we disagree because the role of the central bank has shifted from a lender of last resort, somebody, an, an entity to which bankruptcy remains a possibility. It's simply that your claim now faces the state and you have reduced the risk of others who are interacting with you facing unintentional bankruptcy, thereby freezing up transactions to a system in which the central bank has become the purchaser of last resort and effectively guaranteeing liquidity and solvency. That's a huge difference. And it's a change that's only occurred in the last 15 years. And it's something that we have to stop doing. OK, great. And I, I want to give your own and you a chance to to comment on the practicality of what's happening these days in terms of, yes, there's the theory of what it's supposed to do. And then we can kind of do the report card on how well it's actually performing on these things. Cause it sounds like both of you will give the fed some pretty poor grades here. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I want to stick with you. For let me just, let me just yeah. note just on that issue that, that in both funds, both in terms of concentration of power and in terms of, um, uh, you know, Linda, uh, uh, the facilitating smoothing out the economy, if you will, or smoothing out crises. Uh, the Fed should get an F on both of them. Um, the banking system is far was far more fragmented uh, in uh, 1914 when the Fed was created. There were far more banks in the United States. There was far less concentration. As big as J.P. Morgan was, he didn't have. Uh, uh, you know, the, the the New York banks didn't have as much of the deposits as the New York banks have today. It's not really New York, it's New York and, uh, and uh, uh, North Carolina and San Francisco. But, but it's, it's basically the big banks today have much more power than they did have back then in terms of just sheer size, put aside uh, political power. Uh, but they also have political power. It's no accident that every, almost every Treasury Secretary is a Goldman Sachs alumni, right? I mean, so, so politics and banking have become more uh, you know, immersed in one another than they were in 1907, right, where it was still pretty loose. Uh, and in the sense of smoothing out the business cycle and in preventing uh, crises, again, the Fed, I think, gets an F. Um, it, it, uh, there are far more business cycles. Uh, there are far more problems post-Fed than there were pre-Fed. Uh, the Fed has exacerbated problems. The, the Great Depression is probably the classic example of that, where it both created the Great Depression and then made it worse um, in, in its in bad management of the money supply and, and uh, bad management of, of, uh, of the crisis. So, you know, the, the Fed, while those might have been the goals, if those were the goals, then we should be in a position today to say, huh, I wonder if there's a better way to do this. <laughs> because suddenly... The Fed has not, you know, been good at either one of the of the goals that we set. Great, and you're going to promise you, I'm coming to that question. Um, but a couple more questions for you beforehand, Mike, and then I'll, I'll let you guys just run. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Fed because it's the it's the central bank that largely sets the the drumbeat that the rest of the world central banks follow. Um, it, it currently has two mandates. 
right? It's got price stability and it's got full employment. And so um, again, just talking theoretically here for being that theoretical backstop for the economy, are those the two right mandates for the job? No, I mean, if you're gonna have a Fed, you know, the only mandate it should have, if it's going to have a mandate, is is price stability. I mean, the idea of of injecting employment in there, uh, which is, uh, you know, depending on your beliefs about the Phillips curve, um, is it, it creates a complexity and creates a conflict within the Fed that is unhealthy and uh, and, and 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 only creates problems. Of course, if you want the the central bank just to be the land of last resort. If you want the central bank just to be the arbitrator of that, then maybe it doesn't even need the mandate for price stability, although it has it because it has the ability to uh, to not only create money, but to tell the banking system how much money they can create by, by setting reserve requirements and, and regulating the banking sector in the particular way that it does. So, uh, no, the, federal, the, the, the Fed, uh, to the extent that it exists, should only have one mandate. It should be a, a straightforward mandate. It should be price stability. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that the unemployment mandate was added uh, after it had already failed to do the price stability stuff, right? So it, it failed with the one mandate. So we gave it a second one. Maybe, maybe they'd be better doing two rather than one. Because right? <laughs> I think it was added... And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I'm sure you will, uh, in, in the early 80s or, or late 70s, the second uh, mandate, so after infl the, 70, the inflation of the 70s. Yeah, I, I believe that's correct. I'm, I'm not going to look it up. But I, and, and by the way, I looked up the standard oil just because it was so at odds with my memory. And, and, you're, and, and it turns out you're right, and I was wrong. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. That was very gracious of you. Um, the, 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 first of all, I actually completely agree with that. One of the challenges is, is that when you talk about employment stability or maximum employment and price stability, you're interjecting a trade-off into an entity that has limited tools or at least should have very, very limited tools associated with it. So that degree of overreach is actually what I think the primary issue is going on, which is that our government itself has abrogated its responsibility for making hard decisions to the relatively easy choices that can be made within monetary policy because they feel so remote. Right, and, and sorry to interrupt you, but it, it, the government doesn't like to say no, and this gives it a convenient way not to do so, correct? Well, it does it all the time. It, it, it delegates to its regulatory, regulatory agencies now uh, the power to to pass laws, basically, the federal, the, the, the Supreme Court just uh, you know sh limited that with the EPA, but but all the regulatory agencies have the power to write laws in a sense, and 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 that is a default of Congress. It's done it on foreign policy. It's done it in immigration, where it's let the executive make decisions which really belong to Congress. So uh, on all these issues, Congress has basically abrogated their responsibility. Let me just add a third function of the Federal Reserve that is not mentioned, but is clearly part of what it does, which is uh, it neither has necessarily to do with uh, stable prices or um, employment, and that is regulate regulation. I mean, the Federal Reserve is the, the predominant regulator of the banking system. It, it, it employs a massive army of regulators. Uh, you know, I, I saw once a statistic where uh, at... Um, I think it was JP Morgan, or maybe it was uh, one of the others. Uh, 150 regulators go to work, let's say a chase every day at the chase building in the bank, right? They have offices next to CEO, they, you know, and these are mostly, mostly Federal Reserve regulators. So they are running our banking system more than just being the land of last resort. They're literally in the offices approving or disproving uh, functions of the bank. And in that sense, I'm not convinced we have a private banking system. I think we have a, a heavily socialized banking system that is basically we it's it's we pretend it's private. We give it all the features of private, but we so control it that it's really a government banking system, government run banking system. And the Fed, the Fed is a we have five regulatory agencies responsible for regulating banks. That's another funny aspect of our crazy financial system. Uh, the Fed is one of them, and and maybe the the most dominant. And, and, and I unfortunately would actually flip that on its head and say that when you have that type of dynamic, what you suffer from is regulatory capture. Sure. And so we have a hybrid private government, public 
uh, banking system, right? It's, it's the worst of all possible worlds. And I do think that's actually the core issue that we're all struggling with. We react to the Fed not so much because we disagree with the central mission, right? That whether, again, I, your own and I would fundamentally disagree whether JP Morgan or somebody of his ilk should be allowed to accumulate the type of power that was allowed under that framework. Again, I would link that to dynamics in the 14th Amendment that created the, the components of corporate personhood and allowed JP Morgan to inherit the corporate structure from his father, which in turn was able to be passed down, right? So it creates aspects of vampires that live amongst us with 400 year lives. That's a very, very unusual thing in terms of a social structure. Um, when we have this type of system, we do have to have breaks. We do have to have mechanisms that say that is not an appropriate accumulation of power within a social setting. And I would, again, just disagree with your own in a social setting, in, an, in, in a society that exists with interactions between each other the ability of one entity, whether it is the Pope or it is JP Morgan, to effectively excommunicate me from the tribe is unacceptable. We're seeing that today with Twitter and its ability to excommunicate somebody from the public sphere in, its, in speech. So it's so, all the same underlying component. If we want to have components of limitations on private power, then we have to have regulatory mechanisms. The central bank is one of those. We're screwing it up. Yeah, so the fundamental disagreement is whether we want to limit private power. I don't. I don't want to limit Twitter's right. ability to throw out the president of the United States or me, for that matter, off of Twitter. Uh, I think they have every right to do it, and I think it's I think it's a, a huge mistake and uh, and and creates many many more problems than it tries to solve to give the government the power to decide whose power is too big and whose power isn't. I think that's much more dangerous than any private power. Uh, or any power that private enterprise can ever accumulate. Got it. And, and I think we've made that distinction pretty clear here. And, and Yaron, I want to come back around to your question about, OK, so what's better? But before we get there, I do just want to ask Mike a couple. I want him to clarify a couple quick things. So, Mike, um, the very clear you think that the that there should be a role, Fed or otherwise, to prevent that that excess advantage concentration. Um, in terms of running the system, if I understood your comments correctly, I think like you, you, you think that price stability is the right mandate, maybe not so sure about um, the employment rate. Um, clarify that if, if, if necessary. But the, the follow-up question is just, right now the Fed has relatively crude tools to do that. You know, mainly it's got the ability to change interest rates and it's got the ability to make at assets purchases or in theory, at least with quantitative tightening, asset sales into the system. Um, are those the right are those the right powers for a central bank to be able to do to fulfill on its mission, or would you grant it different powers? Yeah. You know, so the the only powers that I would grant the Fed is actually the power to be the lender of last resort and the facilitator of government expenditures. Um, in other words, the marketer of government, the exclusive marketer of government debt through franchise in, in various forms. The idea that they should be able to set interest rates in any other mechanism than what it actually costs the government to finance itself and to effectively establish that as a base rate is, in my opinion, totally wrong, right? Um, we're taking a very, very blunt tool. I liken it to using a battle axe to perform surgery, right? Uh, the, what you're doing with an interest rate is you are establishing a base level cost of borrowing for every entity in the system and setting everything off of that. That's a ridiculous level of power for 12 individuals. And, and think about it in terms of, we, we understand that setting price controls on other products is a bad idea. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, we know that if the government tries to set the price of bread, it screws it up. We saw the bread lines in, in uh, socialist countries and what happened. So, so we, we tend, in America, not to set prices, not to let the government set prices. We tend the market to work. But then we take the most important price in the economy. And I would argue interest rates are the most important price in the economy because in some ways they help determine every other price. It's the price of money they're setting. It's the price of money, which means the price of time because of credit. It's it's the largest extent the price of time. It's the discount rate. It's, it's the most important price in the economy. And we let a bunch of 12 guys, maybe a gal or two in there as well, um, 
to sit down in a committee of central planners to decide what the right interest rate is. They don't have a clue. They, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve has become the largest employer of economists in the world. More economists work for the Federal Reserve than for any other single institution. Um, and what do they do all day? They run models to try to centrally plan this one price. They don't know what they're doing. Nobody does. That's the beauty of a marketplace. It's too complex uh, so that you cannot predict it. You cannot set prices. This is why we don't try in other areas. We shouldn't be trying in interest rates. It's the worst price to centrally plan. And it okay, has the worst great. consequences. Great. I, and and I, I know you've got additional thoughts about what a market-based solution would look like. We're just about there. Real quick, back to you, Mike, for a second. So sure. if I heard you correctly, you're saying... Um, all right, uh, you don't think the Fed, the, the Fed, we'll stick with the Fed, um, should be able to muck around with interest rates. It really should have much more of sort of an emergency type role. Um, so I'm guessing you would you would price some pretty hard limits that says, look, the Fed really shouldn't even come into to, to action unless X, Y, or Z happens. And then it, it's, its powers should be limited only during the, the period of, of some sort of emergency. Uh, is, is that accurate? Yes. So, so, so the easiest way to think about the way I would utilize the Fed, for example, right, is for the Fed, what the Fed's primary role is, Lehman Brothers cannot borrow in the open market. Lehman Brothers has significant assets. It turns out that Lehman Brothers was actually relatively solvent, except for the panic conditions that existed in 2008. Lehman Brothers should present assets that are currently in distress by the market. They should demonstrate to the Fed that they should be able to take a collateral haircut against that and obtain treasuries that they can then use to finance themselves, that they can use to obtain additional collateral by putting that against it. There is risk that is held by the government in that scenario. It is less risk than would be expected within a system if private individuals were forced to discount those, but you're taking good collateral and turning it into liquid instruments. Okay. And I, and I, so interrupt, but I, I assume don't let me put words in your mouth, but I assume that there would be, you know, it would be a painful loan. In other words, oh, this, is, this is not an easy bailout. This is not trying to let people skate on their bad decisions. This is, hey, this is your lifeline before bankruptcy, but it's it's not going to be a, a bed of roses. We know this model from the 19th century. This is Bajajo, right? Lend at high rates of interest against good collateral. We know that that model. We know it works. We refuse to engage in it. Okay. All right. Now, you're right. now I'm coming to you, right? Which is the question of now we have sort of a good understanding of the model that Mike thinks should exist. You know, again, might not map exactly where we are today with central yeah. banks, but we got a sense of what he thinks should exist. You think you've got something better. I assume it's going to be heavily, if not entirely market driven, but why don't you go and explain it? Yeah. I mean, I would argue it should be completely market driven. And in that sense, I don't want to necessarily prescribe what it looks like because I don't exactly know what it looks like. That's the beauty of markets. Markets always innovate in ways that is hard to predict. But it generally would suggest that uh, interest rates are set by borrowers and lenders. They're set in the marketplace. Um, money is, uh, you know, money as, as we know it is created by the banking system, by financial institutions that have some kind of collateral. My, my guess is that collateral is gold, but it might not be gold. It might be something else. I don't know. This is where competition would ultimately determine what the collateral is. So uh, money as we know it, the paper stuff, the dollar bills, or IOUs against that collateral, against that gold, or against whatever it is that the banks decide, um, the system decides ultimately to hold, but that should not be centrally planned. And that when a Lehman Brothers gets into trouble, as, as Michael described it, it either convinces um, another financial institution to give it that really, really harsh loan, or it fails and it goes bankrupt. Um, of course, the entire conditions of the 2008 financial crisis were created by, in my view, the Fed and the kind of the, the, the kind of financial environment that the Fed stimulated in the United States. But so I, I, I I'm sorry to interrupt there. Is, is that because you, you would say the Fed dropped the price of money so low that tons of malinvestment arose? Yeah. So, so, for that? so if, if you remember right after 9 11, Alan Greenspan engineered this uh, dramatic decrease in interest rates 
um, in uh, in 2002 and kept, uh, we, we basically had negative real rates from 2002 to I think 2006, uh, and then uh, increased interest rates very slowly following that. And Benanke, of course, took over and kept interest rates uh, very low. Uh, but beyond that, you know, and, and money money went into things like uh, mortgages because of housing policy. So that wasn't a Fed issue. Although, you know, even there, Alan Greenspan, who everybody listened to, right, because he was this the guru of Wall Street, uh, said, don't take out fixed rate mortgages, take out uh, variable rate mortgages. So people did. And then when interest rates went up, guess what happens when you have a variable rate mortgage? So people listen to the Federal Reserve chairman uh, and he gives advice and, and it's a very dangerous position to be in. But, but yes, I, will, I want money to be privatized in the sense that I want a private financial uh, world. I want, you know, I want it separate from government. I would like to see government borrowing be minimal um, in, in such a system uh, and uh, that it, it basically run uh, no deficits other than in emergencies, other than when it has to, wars and things like that. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't need this financing entity. That uh, that the Fed has has become, where where it 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 becomes the first purchaser in recent times of all government debt. Um, okay, so right. yes, I leave it to the market and see what happens. All right, I got a couple of questions for you here, and then Michael, I'm going to let you whack at the pinata any way you like. Okay, um, Iran, if if the, if if just the banks are are left to to create money, um, is there a unified currency here, or are you have the mindset of Hey, if a bank wants to create its own currency, we can just have competition in the marketplace, and the, the the better currencies will rise to the top. I think you'll ultimately get a unified currency. Uh, I think that that is probably what you get. Even in the 19th century, uh, you basically had one currency uh, among Western countries, and that was gold. Uh, you had dollars and pounds and other, uh, you know, local currencies, but they all denominated in gold. So uh, what really determined uh, kind of uh, uh, the monetary flow was the flow of gold bars from one place to another. Now, maybe it's not gold, right? Maybe maybe somebody can convince me that it's Bitcoin or, or something like that. But it, I, I do think you get, you get one standardized um, currency uh, that then uh, you might see competition. You might see a bank decide, no, I'm going to do platinum or I'm going to do Bitcoin and let them compete. And I, I think the market will very quickly uh, organize around one currency because it's just so much more efficient. All right. It's and then how, how, how about lending standards like, um, you know, fractional reserve lending and whatnot, right? Like, who, is, is, should there be a regulator sort of setting those standards and, and, and making sure that they're being obeyed? Or is it, we'll just, no, I mean, it's, the flies, it's, we'll let the, <laughs> every bank do what it wants. Complete free fall. Uh, I mean, the only restriction I would place is you can't commit fraud, right? So you can't, for example, tell depositors, you can get your money on demand whenever you want and then uh, use fractional reserve banking because obviously they can't get their money whenever they want if you're, if you're doing fractional reserve. So if you're using fractional reserve banking, the contract has to stay. You can get your money whenever you want, mostly, but once in a while, you won't be able to get it. And it has to be contractual in advance. The depositors know. And you can think about banks that have more reserves would offer lower interest on deposits. And, and uh, banks that have lower reserves would offer higher interest on deposits to attract people there. So there would be, people would have to, and banks would have to be rated and they would develop a market in rating banks. And uh, that would determine the interest that they paid on deposits, how risky they were, because your deposits would be risky. I don't believe, I, I, they might develop a deposit insurance, a private market for deposit insurance, um, but they might not. And if there isn't a private market deposit insurance, then, uh, banks will have to convince depositors that they are safe and they'll have to find mechanisms by which to, maybe they buy bonds, maybe they do something to convince depositors to deposit their money with them. All right, last question, then I'm going to unleash Mike. Um, so we get into a system economically, you know, we're, we're still going to go through boom, bust and bust in the economy. If we start going into a painful bust where there starts being a cascade of, of, of defaults, uh, just let it all clear. Yes. So well, first, Darwinism I mean, we, is the, 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 absolutely. the most I mean, efficient. OK. Yes. I, I mean, there's no absolutely let it all clear. But let me say this. I truly believe that most booms and busts are caused by the Fed. That is, I think monetary policy is what causes most of these booms and busts. It, it is 
mistakes with regard to interest rates, for example, that cause these problems. Um, now, there will be booms and busts, but they are much more likely to be localized, um, you know, and they're much more likely to be able to be absorbed by the private sector without the kind of systemic risk that we have today in the system. Uh, I think what we're seeing today in terms of the systemic risk that exists out there is a phenomena of centralized power. And centralized power is a phenomenon of government. I don't think you get this kind of centralized power in a private economy. So, uh, but yes, let it rip. I, but I don't think I don't think that that ripping is that big of a deal. I don't think it's that big. I don't think it's that substantial. Uh, I think uh, private markets know how to handle these things and develop mechanisms. And this is the other thing. Let's say M Michael is right, and there's too much power, and and this is going to create some real economic distortions, right? I mean, or, then markets are very good at developing new institutions um, or, or, or new types of products to deal with those kind of situations. Uh, so I, I truly believe that people's the best way to deal with problems is to unleash human ingenuity. And what happens when you create a Federal Reserve, you create a centralized entity that becomes calcified. And it doesn't just become calcified. Uh, it's by its nature, it becomes calcified because it faces no competition, it faces no forces that force it in a sense to stay on its toes and to innovate and be uh, and, and it constantly. The, the, the marketplace is constantly innovating, constantly changing. And as a consequence, we'll find solutions to these problems that are beyond what a central planner can imagine. And they'll constantly have to change and constantly have to innovate as markets change. All right, got it. So bus will be uh, more shallow, they'll be more localized, and they'll probably be over quicker be being more efficiently unleashed. Okay, yeah. Michael, thank you for your grab that stick and swing away. Yeah, so I, I mean, look, I think the story that we were just told about the global financial crisis is illustrative of the challenges that we face in this approach. So the core issue that existed within the global financial crisis. I agree, regulation played a significant role. I do not think that Bren Bernanke telling people to go get variable rate mortgages played any significant role whatsoever. And in fact, the irony is, is that because the Fed cut interest rates so rapidly, we didn't actually see distress emerge from rising interest rates and variable rate mortgages. What actually caused the distress was first payment defaults and fraud within the, the privately rated mortgage system. All right, so mortgages were obtained that were privately rated, that were graded at a certain level, and because the documents they were produced with were fraudulent in nature, putbacks existed that then created off-balance sheet liabilities that came back onto the, onto the bank's balance sheets. And as a result of the dynamic of that, we saw a wave and cascade of defaults throughout the system. So everything that Yaron just mentioned fell apart. Now, did the Fed play a role in articulating certain levels of reserves that needed to be held against certain levels of ratings, et cetera, or the ability to get things off balance sheet. Of course it did, but that's gonna be true in any setting. And any private system is subject to the exact same corruption that your own is attributing to the Fed. I can take a, a private rating agency middle manager out for steak dinners and they can upgrade the ratings on my bonds. Who becomes liable for that? Who goes to jail on that? It's too small of a crime to really prosecute, right? Does the management, does the CEO of the ratings agency go to jail? No, of course not. The core issue that we're talking about is yes, systems become corrupted. Yes, systems become too large. Does that mean that we shouldn't attempt to regulate them, that we shouldn't attempt to solve those problems? The answer of course is no, we should do a better job of it. What Yaron and I both agree on, and I've read some of his stuff, I've watched some of his stuff before, is that we should do a better job of electing and appointing regulators and leaders, whether those are politicians or, or um, regulators placed in roles, that enforce the responsibility of the individual and minimize the role of the state in this process. But we can't ignore the role of the state. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah, so... The problem is that uh, whenever you give regulators regulatory power, you're going to create corruption and you can create systemic risk. I mean, I'm glad you brought up rating agencies because, I mean, rating agencies are so perfect uh, as an illustration of exactly this example. 
There are only three, or at least in 2008, there were only three ra uh, rating agencies. Um, there were only three because only three were certified by the government, by the SEC. Uh, these were rating agencies that had failed repeatedly. Uh, I remember Orange County going bankrupt um, just weeks after it had a AAA rating uh, from the rating agencies. I remember Enron going bankrupt just uh, a couple of months after it got AAA ratings from the rating agencies. Why didn't those rating agencies suffer any consequences from being so bad at what they did? Why is that uh, the guy who uh, you took out to dinner and who raised the rating of your bond and then something bad happened? Why are there no economic consequences to him? Because these are rating agencies protected by government monopoly power. It's, an, it's not a monopoly, it's an oligopoly because there are three of them. Now, why does anybody pay attention to those ratings? This is, this is what happens when you get regulations. They build upon one, the other. It's because ERISA forces institutional investors only to invest in rated securities. So insurance companies, pension plans, and many others have to use the rating agencies. They have no choice. Uh, hedge funds don't pay any attention to uh, the ratings of rating agencies. They just don't because they know it's completely corrupt right? it, because it's, run, it's, it's a government entity. So the problem with any attempt, even by the best people, even if you put saints in positions of regulatory power, they will be corrupted by the system because they are now wielding force. Uh, and this is going back to the difference between us in terms of violence versus voluntary exchange. Uh, as soon as you give people the power to wield force, to wield coercion, uh, that is a corrupting influence. And of course, you put them in a position to regulate markets where they have no clue how to regulate the regulators uh, are not going to be smarter than the bankers they try to regulate. Uh, they're always going to be captured if uh, there's just no other alternative. There is no other way. There's no other country where they're not captured. Um, the, the, the best way is to let markets self-regulate. That is to let markets develop rating agencies because there are rating agencies outside of the banking system that are not uh, provided uh, government monopoly. They do a pretty good job. Uh, and I think you can create a market in regular in, in rating agencies, a real market in rating agencies. I think, you know, on a different topic, I think we should get rid of the FDA and privatize that function. And privatize that function means rating agencies, agencies that test drugs and give them ratings to doctors. Uh, that's, that's the proper way to separate coercion and force from markets and, and leave these regulatory functions to volunteer exchange. I think you get far superior outcomes um, and you don't get the kind of, yeah, you get corruption. You always have corruption. Let the government focus on putting corrupt people in jail. If that's all it did, if the SEC, instead of reading my 13 Ds and 13 Gs, if the SEC just went after the Bernie Madoffs, then it would be a part of the police force going after corrupt people. But we know that's not what it does. As soon as you create an SEC, it wants, it wants to control me. It wants to tell me what I can and cannot do. And, it, and Bernie Madoff, to hell with him, even though they knew what he was, you know, they, they got reports on what he was doing, they never caught him and they, they, they were too busy. They were too busy, you know, following up on Michael and my trading uh, to, to worry about uh, uh, a real fraud stuff. All right. Well, look, I've got a key question I, I want to ask both of you as we begin to wrap up here. But first, Mike, I want to give you a chance to respond to what your own just said and, and just address the general question. How do you solve for the human fallibility element of the equation here? You can't. I mean, unfortunately, that's the reality. We can't. We're always going to have it, whether it's in private institutions or public institutions. Humans are fallible. Machines, which are programmed by humans, are fallible. Right? So there is no solution to this. We ultimately have to recognize that we have to accommodate it. We have to build systems that are robust enough to begin to address these failings, which is why those regulatory frameworks emerged in the first place. They emerged because somebody showed up in a Western town saying, I'm starting a bank. This bank can never fail. It's backed by tremendously wealthy individuals on the East Coast, all of which turned out to be a lie. In the meantime, the local townspeople put their money into the bank and that scam artist left, right? So we've placed regulatory burdens in order to prevent that. The 13 Ds and 13 Fs that I have to file as an institutional investor exist to facilitate the capture of the Bernie Madoffs. Is the SEC any good at it? No, they're not. Should they be better? 
Absolutely. But the reason we produce those documents is to facilitate the identification of those fraudsters. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But we have to recognize that we have to try. We have to have components. So should we reduce excessive regulation wherever possible? Absolutely. But we will never get rid of corruption exactly as your own said, whether that's in the private sector or that's in the public sector. All right. So here's here's the what I'll consider to be the, the big last question of the debate. And I appreciate you gentlemen going this long with us. It's been a wonderful conversation so far. Um, and, and I'll start with you, Mike, which is um, let's say that uh, the American populace uh, watches this video. It becomes uh, the, the most watched video on YouTube. And everybody says, put Mike Green in charge, give him give him absolute power to re reform the system any way that he likes. Um, what would you do? I would radically restrict the ability of the Federal Reserve to involve itself in the economy. OK, and are there any particular hard lines you, you, you know you'd want to dry right away, draw right away? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the immediate one is I would re return to a lender of last resort in exactly the fashion that I described. If a panic exists, you as an institution can turn to the Fed. You can make a case to me why I should take a very high quality collateral and at a very high rate of interest in order to provide you with the liquidity to meet your short term obligations. If you default on those, your investors lose, right? You go through the bankruptcy process facing me as, as the government and potentially, by the way, facing criminal liability for misstatements that you might have made to me in the process, right? So it is a very punitive system that I'm describing under those conditions. Exactly to your own point, that would introduce a component where private citizens, private entities can step in and play a role that would be ahead of me. But I am there as the lender of last resort. I'm not the purchaser of first resort, which is the role that it's currently playing. OK, so you're, you're out of the trying to get the full employment game. You're out of the setting interest rates game. On the interest rate side of things, what would be your preferred process for setting interest rates. Uh, some people here, I asked Twitter, you know, have, have mentioned uh, uh, Goodlock has said that the Fed funds rate should just be set to the two-year treasury yield. Would you, would you have some benchmark like that or how would you want to do it? Well, functionally, that's what you would do if you decided to set interest rates based on marketing government debt, right? So I would put debt out and I would play the role of a banker. I would advise the U.S. government. I think there's shortages at the three-month point. I think there's surpluses at the 10-year point. You should try to get the lowest possible financing rate for the U.S. government by meeting those relative, you know, uh, uh, arbitrage opportunities that exist. But I'm establishing a private market price for a non-defaultable instrument in the form of U.S. government debt. That's all I'm doing. I'm not setting it. I'm allowing the market to set it for me. You're allowing it to be set. Got it. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, Yaron, coming over to you. Um, I, I assume your solution is pretty much just burn it all down and, and let the market take over. Well, um, I mean, I mean you, I'm, I'm not a burn it all. Yeah. Well, real quick, yeah. we, we put you in charge here. Yeah. Do you dismantle it all on day one? Or you know, no. can, can, can we survive that shock? Or do we need to do this over some progressive period of time? I think you have to do it over a progressive period of time. You can't, you can't dismantle everything all at once. Uh, I mean, just unwinding all the regulatory uh, apparatus that exists today over banks would take years. I mean, it, it, this is not something that can happen quickly. I, but I would, what I would do is I would set, I would set a framework. I would say, okay, over the next four years, over the next eight years, whatever, you know, four years seems more likely given given the length of uh, an administration. Over the next four years, these are the steps that are going to happen. You know, maybe the step one is we're going to get the Fed out of the business of setting interest rates. We're going to get, we're going to make it the land of last resort. I mean. Uh, the fact is, a, a central bank that does what Michael suggests is a lot less offensive, a lot less offensive than than the current central bank. That could be a phase towards, you know, maybe then once it's doing that, I can show Michael, eh, we don't really even need that, Michael. You know, look, the market can take care of this. So uh, I, I think you have to carefully unwind. It's very difficult to unwind the regulations that exist today. I mean, think about we've got 70, 80 years of regulation over the banking system. If you do away with the Fed, you also have to unwind all of that. You've got deposit insurance. You can't do it all at once. You create massive moral hazard if you do it all at once. You have to really think through what goes first and what goes last. So yes, I would take full 
ideally even eight years to do this properly and to do it systematically and to do it slowly with plenty of, uh, you know, letting the market know what's coming so that the market could start pricing these things, can start anticipating what's coming. But of course, in a, in a, this is the problem with a radical point of view like mine is that in a, in a political system like ours, it's almost impossible to do anything that has long-term kind of, where you actually have to plan and think through how you're going to do something. Uh, that doesn't exist in our political system today. It's all, uh, it's all rush, 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 and uh, delegate delegate the actual uh, details to the regulators who then get captured and and then it becomes a negotiating between the regulators and those who they regulate so it's it's very difficult to do anything radical in the world in which we live right now all right well gentlemen look thank you so much as we begin to wrap this up um uh, you know, I, I appreciate your flexibility and going back and forth with each other. I saw both of you taking sort of furious notes at different times. Is there any other point around this central banking topic in general that you think is important that we haven't addressed here yet? Um, Mike, I'll go to you first. Um, I mean, we, we've alluded to this in a variety of ways, right? Um, the role of the central bank should be, as your own is has has highlighted to finance the U.S. government and it, or the the government, the state, and to facilitate the smooth operating as a lender of last resort, right? To address the immediate panics. But one of the things that that you know both of us have talked about or alluded to are the dynamics of what money actually is. And if you have that system, then you actually solve the problems of do we have state sponsored money or do we have private money? Right, because what you're actually talking about there is establishing the right of the state to print its own currency, to obtain it, and allowing the market to say how much is that actually worth. The system that we have today that leads to people chasing things like Bitcoin or gold as a monetary solution is a very stopgap measure to addressing those concerns. And so, you know, the, the issue is not whether we have fiat, as exactly as, as your own and many others have pointed out anything can really function as money. There are certain characteristics, components of gold being a, a particular molecular makeup and behavior that made it uniquely suited in history, but we don't need to return to that. And we certainly don't need to go to something like Bitcoin, which has interesting characteristics in terms of its mechanism of recording transactions and establishing truth from that standpoint, but Bitcoin is just a randomized um, issuance schedule for a speculative asset, right? It has no true monetary characteristics whatsoever. And so I just think it's really important that people understand those components as they evaluate this dynamic of central banks. And what a central bank should be doing is radically different than this idea of fix the money, fix the world sort of stuff. Got it. All right. Well, thanks for making sure that the whole Bitcoin crowd is going to leave a lot of angry comments uh, below here. That was um, but, but no, yeah, I, I, and you're, you're making me realize I, I didn't hear you say at any point in this debate that you think that the, the government should be in the business of, of either A, having a monopoly on what the money is, or B, should even be creating money at all. Um, is, that, is that true? Um, Your own what I'm describing is, is that the, the government, the, yeah, so the government has a potentially unique role in introducing a non-counterfeitable, easily verified document, whether that's in digital form or paper form, that we can use as a monetary mechanism. That's all coinage is, right? Um, that's all a dollar bill is. That's the serial number is supposedly there for in the various strips, et cetera. The fact that the government monopolizes that, is the sole physical printer of that is actually somewhat necessary, right? You really can't rely, you, you can use the private institutions to expand that in a flexible way. They can introduce their own pseudo monetary instruments, banknotes, for example, in the 19th century. But exactly as your own said, there's tremendous economies of scale associated with a single issuer of that document. And again, it can be digital, it can be paper, it could be coinage. Okay. So again, just to just to clarify, it sounds like you think the government can play that role and maybe should, but I think the government necessarily play, have it. Yeah, I think the government should play that role. I think there's tremendous economies of scale associated with it, but you then have to have the market's ability to affect how that's priced. That's the acceptance of the market pricing of that debt instrument. 
Okay, and, and and again, just to make sure we understand where you're coming from, um, should that be the only coin of the realm, or should there be a thousand flowers allowed to bloom to see if any one of them ever gets up to equivalent scale? From an efficiency standpoint, that should be the only mechanism that is accepted for payment of government taxes. All right. Okay. Um, Yaron, over to you. Um, any topics dear to your heart we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this relates to it. I, I don't think the government should should be uh, the issue of, of, uh, of money. I don't think it should be involved. The only, the only role it should play is to basically uh, announce what, what money it is willing to accept uh, in payment for taxes. Uh, so, uh, you know, whether that's uh, gold, whether that's whatever it lands up being. Um, so, uh, but the government itself should not issuing coin, it shouldn't coin anything, it shouldn't print, it shouldn't be dig digital. It shouldn't be involved in the economic system and it certainly shouldn't be involved in money. And of course, one of the things we, we haven't talked about is, is the fact that when the government does this and the fact that since 1914, since the creation of the Federal Reserve, the value of the dollar has declined by 90 something percent. That is the purchasing power of the dollar has, uh, has, has been inflated away. Uh, and that is part of, uh, part of what central banks and part of what government does when it issues currency. Again, it doesn't have to. We can imagine a world in which the government is responsible and it doesn't and it just gets it right but that's science fiction. The fact is that all governments do this. They always do it. it it's too tempting not to, uh, to pin up money, to finance, uh, to finance their own uh, deficit spending. And, um, and of course, it, it's, they, they can't decide how much money exactly to issue because you don't have a market to determine it. The beauty, I think, of a private system is, again, that the market will determine how much money gets issued um, and, uh, and, and how it gets priced. So inflation is a big deal, as we're experiencing right now in the United States. Price, you know, price consumer inflation is a big deal. It's a big deal from an economics perspective. It's a big deal in terms of quality of life and standard of living for people. And it's a big deal that it basically is a function of the government monopoly over money and uh, the function of a central bank. Uh, there was uh, basically... There was no real uh, uh, erosion in the uh, purchasing power of the dollar during the 19th century. Uh, and in Canada and other countries where there was no central bank, there was no erosion in the purchasing power of their currencies. Uh, central banks create that erosion in purchasing power. And that's, that's a way of redistributing wealth that is a stealth way of redistributing wealth without going through the political process of approving the redistribution of wealth. I'm not sure people would be happy about how the wealth is being redistributed, but it's a massive redistribution of wealth that is just unjust and, and wrong. All right. Well, gentlemen, I could go easily for another hour or two. I think you guys have at least that in you. But sadly, I've, I've got to let you get back to your families. It's getting late. Your time's in the evening. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for giving us uh, such an excellent discussion here. Um, great insights. Uh, great uh, repartee between the two of you. I really appreciate the professional respect that you guys show each other um, as you have points of disagreement here. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed this debate and would like to follow both of you and your work, um, where should they go? Mike, let's start with you. So the easiest place to find me is at simplify.us, www.simplify.us. Um, I also am very active on Twitter. Um, confusingly, my Twitter handle is at Prof Plum 99, P-R-O-F-P-L-U-M 99, um, which to address the answer is a total play on uh, the game board game Clue and my name being Mr. Green. So Nice. There you go. And look, um, when we edit this, we will put up the URLs to your websites and your Twitter handles as well, gentlemen. Um, Yaron, how about you? Yeah, so uh, iranbrookshow.com. Uh, you can find me on, on YouTube primarily, but I'm also on Twitter, just at Yaron Brook. And uh, you can also find a lot of material at the Ayn Rand Institute website. So ayn Rand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. 
Fantastic. Uh, and uh, I follow both you on Twitter. I highly recommend people do that. Gentlemen, I hope you don't mind. I know there's going to be a number of questions folks have that we didn't get to. If they have the ability to ping you, uh, you know, ask them of your Twitter account. If you guys have the bandwidth to give them a short answer, that would be highly appreciated by those folks. Um, folks, again, too, you know, in this the real world in which we live, where so much is influenced by central bank policy, and there's so many... Um, uh, unintended consequences, many of them not very pleasant right now that we're facing, you know, everything from uh, high inflation right now to uh, a contracting economy, at least here in the U.S. Um, it's a very, very difficult time to invest. I know the number one question we get here at Wealthion is what should I be doing with my capital in this type of environment? Um, if you so we recommend two things. We recommend that you work with a professional financial advisor who understands the macro issues that these gentlemen have been talking about here. Honestly, folks, not that many do. So take the time to find a good one. If you have a good one, stick with them. Uh, they're worth your weight in gold. Maybe even send them a copy of this video, have them watch it and say, hey, how are you positioning me for the issues these guys talked about? But if you don't have one or would like a second opinion by a good one that does understand all these issues, uh, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, and we can connect you with one of the financial advisors that we endorse for a free consultation. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. They just offer it as a public service. Um, all right, folks. Well, look, um, again, uh, Yaron and Mike, can't uh, thank you guys enough for doing this. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of demand to have you guys back on to bat around another different topic in the future. I hope you guys are open for that. And folks, if you'd like to see that happen, please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having us.